Fibrosis and non-fibrosis. It's uh, it's a kidney, um, and it's about uh, matrix turnover in in, uh, in chronic kidney disease. Um, it's uh, Daniel uh, Rasmussen who's been in the group uh, for seven years doing fibrosis together with uh, uh, Diane and Frederica. It's also important that, that Daniel is also leading a European consortium uh, looking at uh, at uh, kidney transplant. So he's really making his uh, his mark in in kidney research and uh, some of the some of the, my favorite um, collagen balance data are actually coming out of kidney. Uh, so Daniel, thanks for uh, for spending the time and uh, for uh, for taking the time to talk to us today. We look forward to to see and hear your data. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Morten. I hope that everyone can see me now. Uh, so like Morten said, my name is Daniel Rasmussen and I'm a senior scientist here at Nordic Bioscience. I will today talk to you about why the extracellular matrix provides a, so a source of biomarkers that both reflect diagnosis, prognosis, and uh, can be used for pharmacodynamic modulation. So today's title will be turnover of the interstitial extracellular matrix as a predictor of adverse outcomes and the potential effect of treatments on the extracellular matrix. So before moving into my slides, so of course I'm showing you biomarker data that there's our biomarkers, but without our highly esteemed collaborators, we would not be here. So I've listed in this slide some of the collaborators from which I have used cohorts and data to show to you today. So when looking at kidney disease, the first thing that comes to mind is global prevalence. And it's fairly obvious and, and quickly seen that the global prevalence is around 9.1%. And also when looking at the most common drivers of CKD in the Western world, at least, this is diabetes and hypertension. What struck me uh, when I looked a bit into uh, the cost of the management of CKD patients, what it was quite clear that the costs are increasing. And here I have focused on the age group of uh, age 66 and above. And looking from 2003 to 2018, the cost for the management of this patient group, so CKD patients above age 66 years of age, the cost increased by more than sevenfold. And looking at patients with end-stage renal disease, the cost increased by more than twofold. And when you couple that with the fact that patient, uh, people, individuals, we are getting older and older. And from 1850 to around 1950, the increase in life expectancy was due to a decline in early and midlife mortality. But from 1950 and onwards, actually what led to an increase in life expectancy was due to a decline in late life mortality. So a larger proportion of individuals will be aged 66 years and above. Furthermore, the, there's also going to be uh, an increase in the population size, which underlines that the burden of chronic kidney disease on the healthcare uh, system is going to increase quite substantially over the years. So when looking at mortality related to CKD, CKD so this is only CKD where the patient, uh, so mortality where the patient has died of CKD, not with CKD. And in 2017, 1.2 million people died on a global scale of CKD. And looking at projections for until 2040, there is in the best case scenario that is going to increase to 2.2 million. And in the worst case scenario, that is going to be 4 million people. Looking a bit more into mortality, it is interesting to see that from 1990 to 2017, mortality has declined significantly for cardiovascular disease, cancer, and chronic obstructive pulmonary fibrosis. But when looking at chronic kidney disease, on the other hand, there is no similar decline is seen for this patient group. So new treatment regimens that halt or slow disease progression are being pursued. That has led to the landscape for drug development uh, to change. And especially this is the case for diabetic kidney disease. Uh, 
And also, and that is interesting, there are more innovative ways of tackling the disease that are being attempted because the usual attempts do not seem to have merited uh, enough results or great enough results. There's also a sense of hope and excitement in the field due to recent successes of which can be named SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, which have shown very promising results. So in this slide, I have listed some of the treatment modalities that are available for patients with uh, chronic kidney disease and how they impact the different uh, endpoints. End and, but despite the increasing treatment options, there's still a large residual risk that can be reduced further with novel treatments. And that it's interesting yesterday, Alexander Krauk and today again, uh, George uh, Flett, 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 uh, talked about the imprecision medicine. And here, that is in essence that you have uh, an indication, you have inclusion criteria, and then everyone is treated. Then you have patients that have a high response, you have patients that have a low response, and then you have non-responders. And actually, the, the, the paper from Nature that was shown yesterday and today again, this is actually not the case. It's very few patients that actually really benefit from the treatment. And that has led to a more precision medicine or personalized medicine approach where we pre-screen the patient. And based on this, you decide whether the patient should be treated, whether there, there needs to be a risk benefit analysis up front, or if the, the patient should not receive treatment. And what uh, different groups amongst others, others ourselves have seen that we can select patient groups that do not treat from uh, benefit from treatment, but they are also the ones that are at higher risk of serious adverse events, so they should not receive the treatment. So what is needed to speed innovation? And I could give a list myself, and I could also list some uh, from our collaborators that I find to be highly relevant. But I, I want to share with you some items that were uh, shared by Dr. Alyssa Thompson. And Dr. Alyssa Thompson is the uh, deputy director uh, of the Division for Cardiovascular and Renal Products in the FDA. And she highlighted some items. The first item was the need for better risk prediction models for disease progression, particularly in patients with very early disease, because there the destruction of the tissue can still be halted or reversed. There was a need for a better understanding of the causative pathways. There was a need for uh, the ability to stratify patients into distinct disease subsets. And there, were, uh, there was a need for pharmacodynamic response biomarkers beyond albuminuria that can be used in early studies to support proof of concept and dose selection. So before moving onward, I'm going to show you a very simplified way of how kidney disease develops, sort of the, an, an, an evil circle, if you, if you like. There is a chronic or repetitive insult that leads to inflammation. The inflammation then drives fibrosis. Fibrosis leads to uh, a pressure on, on the vessels, which reduces glomerular perfusion which leads to a reduced uh, endothelial cell survival, microvascular verification, so loss of blood vessels, hypoxia, and then you become full, you come full circle. When humans are born, it's, it's quite, I, and all of, most of us know that we are born with a large reserve of functional units in the kidneys, nephrons, and I'll return to that in a later slide. But these nephrons, you have a large reserve. So you can lose quite a large, proportion of these functional units before it becomes apparent by a rise in functional markers. So at this point where they're rising, there's already a substantial and potentially irreversible fibrosis present. So what we and other groups are focusing on is to try to find and identify markers of inflammation and fibrosis, which more, are more likely to mimic the fibrosis taking place. And these markers would then in the ideal scenario, provide early diagnosis and intervention markers. So looking at inflammation and fibrosis, I would like to stratify fibrosis further, at least in my opinion, into growth factors and tissue markers. And in the interest of today's talk, I will focus on tissue markers. And in the following slide, I will try to highlight why I think that extracellular matrix markers or tissue markers are very relevant. And before moving into that, I also wanted to highlight that uh, yesterday, Mina Bissell gave an excellent talk highlighting how context determines cell function. 
And that is also the case for this. So the extracellular matrix is made up of compartments. And each of these compartments consists of a specific composition of proteins. And that is important to note. On one side, you have epithelial or endothelial cells that rest upon basement membrane. On the other uh, side, you have the interstitial matrix, which in most organs makes up the largest proportion of the tissue. And then you have an interface between these two, where you have a specialized group of proteins. And the extracellular matrix of each compartment is tailored to support the function of the cells that reside in that compartment. And alterations to the composition disturbs the organ function. And that was excellently shown by Amina Bissell yesterday. So in the following, I will focus a lot on collagens. So just to give you a sort of a brief update or summary on collagens and where they are found. One base membrane uh, collagen could be type 4 collagen that is extensively researched. On the other side, you have interstitial matrix markers such as the fibrillar type 3 collagen. Then you have the interface that I just mentioned, where I would like to highlight uh, collagen such as type 6. So as I said, I wanted to return back to the functional units of the kidney. Uh, so that is the nephron. And just to really briefly say, a nephron is made up of a glomerulus, which is the site of filtration. And then you have the proximal and uh, distal tubules and then collecting ducts. And as I said, you have, can have a healthy or you can have a healthy glomerulus that is functional, then you can have a sclerotic glomerulus, which is non-functional. And due to the large proportion of nephrons, uh, this large reserve of nephrons, a large proportion can be lost before this becomes apparent by an increase or a decrease in kidney function, an increase in kidney function markers. So what happens during disease progression? Here you see a healthy glomerulus and during fibrosis, we have a thickening of the glomerular basement membrane. That is due to, amongst others, an increase in collagen type 1, 3, 4, 6, and fibronectin. You also have mesangial sclerosis, sclerosis which is, is uh, reflected by an increase in collagen type 4, 5, and fibronectin. On the other side, you have the tubular interstitial matrix, which is the largest proportion of the kidneys. And... During fibrosis, we have a thickening of the tubular basement membrane, which is reflected by an increase in predominantly collagen type 4. And you have a marked increase in interstitial fibrosis, which is reflected by an increase in collagen type 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, 15, fibronectin, and versicin. So can we select disease subsets? So patients that have a distinct turnover profile, and does that relate to outcome? So we try to do that in a group of 500 patients with advanced, uh, moderate or advanced kidney disease, and we measured collagen type 3, at collagen type 3 degradation marker, collagen type 3 formation marker, collagen type 6 formation, laminin degradation, so a basement membrane uh, uh, protein. And if you saw Mina Bissell's talk yesterday, this is a laminin. So this is actually gamma one. So one of the ones that she found to be super interesting and versicant degradation. Based on unbiased clustering, we found that there was a cluster of patients that had both low degradation and low formation. We had a cluster that had high degradation and low formation. And then we had a cluster that had high formation and low degradation. And then we looked at uh, first the development of end-stage renal disease. So if you are in one of these clusters, does that affect your risk of developing end-stage renal disease? And yes, it does. So the, the cluster three, the high formation cluster, was three times at higher risk of developing end-stage kidney disease over this period, which was six years. And we looked at mortality, both the high degradation, low formation, and the high formation, low degradation clusters were significantly at an increased risk of dying. So yes, we can actually identify disease subsets that have um, different rates of outcome. In the following, I want to uh, focus a bit on specific biomarkers, just to show that we are not only focusing on the overall turnover profile, but we are also actively investigating each of our biomarkers to try and understand what the biomarker 
provides. So in this case, I want to focus a bit on type six collagen. So one of the collagens found in the interface between the basement membrane and the interstitial matrix. So during deposition or formation of collagen type six, there is a fragment that is released. And this in the following slides, when you see pro C6, that means collagen type six formation. Whereas if you see C6M, that reflects collagen type six degradation mediated by matrix metalloproteinases. We went in and looked at patients stratified into mild, moderate, and advanced disease. And we could see that collagen type six degradation was low in mild disease, increased in moderate, and declined again in advanced disease. Looking at the collagen type six formation marker, on the other hand, it increased from mild to moderate and from moderate to advanced. So that is interesting because that really shows that there is a differential turnover of collagens during disease progression. So we and others have looked into collagen type six and how that looks in the fibrotic kidney, so during pathology. And in this slide, we show non-fibrotic and fibrotic uh, tissue sections. Here, this is total collagen type six. There is low collagen type six in the non-fibrotic kidneys, and there's a marked increase uh, of collagen type six in the fibrotic kidneys. Using the antibody from the pro C6 test, we also stained these sections. We saw that there was no staining in the non-fibrotic kidneys, but that there was a marked staining in, in uh, the fibrotic kidneys in areas that co-localize with areas of increased collagen type 6. So this is the same glomerulus. These are consecutive slides. So at least a proportion of pro C6 originates in a uh, uh, kidney with pathological alterations. We then went in and asked the question, levels of this biomarker uh, in, in a patient, does that correlate to the extent of, for example, tubular interstitial fibrosis or renal fibrosis? And it actually does. We saw that there was a quite uh, significant association of pro C6 with the extent of renal interstitial fibrosis. So it does reflect uh, level, uh, the extent of fibrosis in the kidneys. The next question that we have investigated in different cohorts is, does the biomarker actually provide value if you measure at baseline? Does it provide any prognostic value? And we did that uh, in different studies, as I said, and then we have looked both as a continuous variable and uh, into, for example, tertiles of process 6 low, medium, and high levels. And we were so fortunate to work uh, in the Canvas uh, biomarker sub-study. And in this, we at baseline stratified patients based on proc 6 levels into low, medium, and high. We then adjusted for conventional risk factors such as age, sex, blood pressure, uh, albuminuria, and EGFR, just to name a few. And then we looked at different outcomes. And what we found was that per increase, so adjusted risk per increase in tertile, it was uh, the biomarker levels were associated with heart failure, cardiovascular death, mortality, and a kidney composite uh, outcome, which consisted of a decline in EGFR of more than 40%, renal death, and, uh, and development of end-stage kidney disease. So a different way to look at this is to what is, is the change in pro C6 during a given time period, is that associated with, with uh, any outcomes? And we also did that in the Canvas biomarker sub-study. So we looked at the change from baseline to year three, and then we stratified patients into low change, medium change, and high change. And then we adjusted for uh, the conventional risk factors and looked at the kidney composite outcome. And what we found was that there was a quite significant uh, risk increase per increase in tertile, even adjusted for conventional risk factors. Another question is, was pro C6 modulated by treatment? And it was. So we, we looked into the AWARD-7 trial, uh, which is a uh, carried out by, amongst others, Eli Lilly. And the study consists of moderate or severe uh, chronic kidney disease patients. The patients were either treated with insulin glargine or dulaclotide. And what we saw was that insulin glargine treated patients had an increase in pro C6 over the 52 week period, uh, whereas dulaclotide impacted pro C6 levels. 
In an unpublished study, we've also seen that this change can be quite early, as early as four weeks. So this is an undisclosed uh, metabolic drug where we have seen that already within four weeks, we can see that the levels of proc 6 are significantly reduced. So it's also early. So I've shown you that proc 6 meets multiple biomarker criteria, but I'm saving the best for last, at least if you ask me, because during the release of this fragment that is recognized by proc 6 this, this fragment is further processed into endotrophin. And due to sequence overlap, proc 6 detects the levels of endotrophin. So this fragment both reflects golden type 6 deposition or formation. But endotrophin has a range of deleterious functions, such as promoting epithelial mesenchymal transition, acting as a chemo attractant on macrophages. And also it's been shown in quite a few studies now that it increases fibrosis and inflammation. So it, that is super and super interesting biomarker. So shifting from the interface, I'm going into the interstitial matrix. And one of the most investigated collagens in the interstitial matrix is probably type three collagen because it makes up the largest proportion of many organs. So during kidney disease progression, we see that there is a marked increase in collagen type three deposition. But what we are interested in is, of course, it, it, it's a marker that it, a protein that is increased during pathology. But what we are more interested in is to investigate the, uh, it, whether there is changes in these patients in the degradation and formation of collagen type 3. So in the following slides, I'm just going to highlight why I'm showing these biomarkers. And you may already have seen some of these in previous uh, presentations. So during the formation and deposition of collagen type 3, there are some propeptides that are released at the N and the C terminal. The N-terminal propeptide fragments are detected specifically by the ProC3 ELISA, which reflects collagen type 3 formation. So in the following slides, ProC3 means collagen type 3 formation. If you see the C3M marker, on the other hand, that is a fragment that reflects degradation of collagen type 3 mediated by matrix metalloproteinases. So we then looked into different patients uh, and looked at both circulating levels of these markers and uh, levels in urine. And what we found for urine was uh, urine levels of collagen type 3 degradation. We saw that it decreased with disease severity. When looking at the uh, formation marker in urine, we saw that it increased. Whereas looking at the same markers in circulation, there is no change in serum or at least no significant change. So we also looked at whether the levels in urine and serum correlated, and there was no correlation. So they may indeed reflect different processes. We went on to investigate uh, levels of collagen type 3 degradation in urine of patients. And we, we asked ourselves, so what does it mean? So what does it mean in terms of hist histological fibrosis, so uh, interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy? And we did that together with Vladimir Tesa from Prague University, where Nadia Sparding, she excellently showed that levels of urinary C3M decreased with increasing interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. On the other hand, when looking at interstitial, or along the same lines, I would rather say, when looking at interstitial fibrosis in the kidneys, there was an inverse correlation between urinary C3M, so called type 3 degradation in urine, and interstitial fibrosis. So there was a quite a significant inverse correlation. And also looking at the glomerular appearance, patients with focal changes in their glomeruli are the ones with the best prognosis in general, at least. And levels of urinary C3M in these patients, they were high compared to crescentic and sclerotic. Uh, so patients with crescentic and sclerotic glomeruli, they had the lowest levels of urinary C3M. We then went in and looked at the prognostic uh, value of these markers. And in these slides, I'm showing you, uh, uh, again, the 500 high, uh, risk advanced to or moderate to advanced CKD patients that at baseline had the biomarker measure levels measured, and then the patients were stratified into above and below median. Looking at collagen type 3 degradation in urine, we could see the patients with the lowest levels of degradation 
They were the ones that developed, were at highest risk of developing end-stage renal disease. But looking at the collagen type 3 formation marker, there was no significant difference. If we then in the same patients looked at mortality, the opposite picture was seen. So we saw that there was no significant effect based on stratification by urinary collagen, uh, collagen type 3 degradation. But looking at collagen type 3 formation, we saw that patients with the highest levels were the ones that died. So the same protein, different markers of that protein reflecting different processes, they can mean different things. We also looked into whether the markers could be modulated by some treatments where, whenever available. And in early disease, so this is the CANVAS biomarker substudy, we, have, uh, we saw that patients on canadliflozin, they had a significant increase from baseline in levels of uh, column type 3 degradation. So keep in mind, this was a good thing. So high levels is good. Whereas placebo-treated patients, they had lower levels during the follow-up. Also looking at, at award seven, we saw that, uh, so looking at award seven, so moderate or severe CKD patients, we saw that patients treated with dulaglutide, they had an increase in the levels of urinary colon type three degradation, whereas the insulin glagine treated patients, they had a reduction. Looking at formation in the Canvas biomarker substudy, there was on the placebo treated patients, they had a significant increase in collagen type 3 formation. So the treatments can impact the levels of the markers. So in the, the previous slides, I've shown you for collagen type 3 that it, it matters understanding the turnover because they can mean completely different things. Also, looking at the prognostic uh, outcome. It's, it's a different picture depending on what marker you're measuring, degradation versus formation. And it also matters, or it's also important to note that there is a pharmacodynamic effect on these markers with relevant treatments. So coming back to my summary slide, or coming to my summary slide, what is needed to speed innovation? These are the items by Dr. Alisa Thompson. So better risk prediction models were needed. And I hope that I've shown you that uh, extracellular matrix uh, markers may provide uh, good prediction models for risk. We also needed uh, to understand uh, causative pathways better. And I've shown you that the same protein, so different markers of the same protein mean different things. They, they, you can increase the granularity and thereby increase the C's understanding. Also, we needed to, uh, the ability to stratify patients into distinct disease subsets. And I've shown you that uh, extracellular matrix uh, markers can be used to identify these uh, groups and that the, that is correlated to differences in adverse outcomes. And finally, the pharmacodynamic biomarkers beyond albuminuria. And I've shown you that the extracellular matrix markers can indeed be modulated by relevant treatments. And with that, I want to thank you for your time.